Hi there, I'm Jody Ferlizzi. I'm from the HCI Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. And my premise is that my discipline and background, I'm trained as a designer, is uniquely poised to bring a critical understanding of how humans interact with and through machine learning. And I'll spend a little bit of time deepening those, that claim with uh, some examples from our work. So I think there are three ways that design can contribute to human-centered machine learning. First, design can give a glimpse of the future with machine learning, even if it doesn't exist yet. Second, design can reframe appropriate uses of machine learning and AI. And third, design can provide vigilance over ML-driven systems. So, the first one, design can provide a glimpse of the future, even when it doesn't exist. Some of the research we're doing now is on this idea that soon we're gonna live in this world of ubiquitous, agents and robots. And we, the instantiations of these things will move from one place to another, from context to context, and people will not understand what's going on. So we're asking questions like, should a Google Assistant drive my autonomous car? And if I use an Alexa at someone else's house, is it my Alexa and is my information left behind? So in order to research this near um, future, we use design methods because a lot of times the technology does not yet exist. So UX has this idea in the upper left that we prototype really quickly and fail fast and often. On the other hand, industrial design laboriously creates these prototypes. And then service design on the right hand side, they're building out a prototype of a um, service delivery for a mobile um, service. And they're starting with cardboard and then they gradually layer the technology in. So we adopted this kind of quick, iterative prototyping, and we called it user enactments. And this user enactment method works because we build out these settings, and we allow people to experience what this technology would be like, even if it doesn't exist yet, especially when there aren't any social norms. So the, tech, the prototypes can be very rudimentary, and they allow for social interaction to unfold. So what we see in this slide is some of the enactments around um, our robot re-embodiment. One took place where you were going to get your driver's license, another was a home office setting, and a third was a doctor's office, and there we had a check-in agent, but then the same agent moved to the next station and uh, did some medical work. And so what we know so far is that people really uh, are still relying on social norms to evaluate these agents, and they have ideas like, the agents are limited in cognitive capability, which is kind of strange because they're computers. And so I think we need more work to kind of explore what, what would be next. My second premise is that design can reframe appropriate uses of machine learning and AI. I think Chan talked about this this morning, so I'll go a little quickly. Um, this was the research that John and Chan did on decision support tools for cardiologists. Um, we saw a lot of problems with how these VADs are implanted and then fail. Um, and so the team was charged to bring AI to the physicians. But they perceived that they had the expertise and they didn't want it. So they did design focused field work and they identified these three pathways um, for decision support tools. One is where a person gets sicker and sicker. They go to sleep, they wake up and they have a VAD. Another is a cyclical decline, better and worse, until it's a last resort. Um, and the third was late referral. So some of these patterns point to a need for decision support tools. And so what the design team did was, instead of creating an entirely new system, they embedded the technology in a PowerPoint slide generator, which is what um, physicians normally use in their work. So slowly they could learn with this confidence score in the lower left, um, and begin to interact with and trust the system. And we did this by integrating technology into the workflow that they already use. And then my third premise is that um, design can provide vigilance over ML-driven systems. Um, sometimes we need human um, intervention or oversight in an AI-driven design space. I'm especially interested in um, cycles where people have to make judgments about other people's judgments. We're looking at um, some of those things in our image tagging and labeling work. And so in the domain of educational games, we explored this problem in this game called Battleship Number Line. And this is a game that's available online for free. You learn about fractions by either um, 
entering an estimate or shooting a missile down at the um, battleship or the fraction mark. So this game, since it's free and public, generates a lot of data. Um, and it is a combinatorial design space. We can have thousands and thousands of players, but still it's hard to know what game combinations of ship targets, target size, difficulty of fractions, and even people's uh, inclinations to what they know about fractions are hard to understand. So we can use um, ML optimized game variations to understand what makes people learn best. And so what we learn, of course, is that a large target is easy to hit and therefore uh, more uh, suggestive of success. But um, here, the system has kind of spun out of control and it made a target that's so large that it doesn't even make sense in the game. So one thing we learned is that uh, machine learning can go so far, we still need designers to sort of oversee what these design renditions might be. So how I think we need to get there, first I think we need to investigate best practices and collaboration between data scientists and designers. Um, we're starting to see a lot of evidence in the literature. These two disciplines struggle to collaborate and um, we want to start, and we have started, by generating some actionable design principles. Second, we want to develop new methods to prototype the non-common sense errors that ML systems make. Um, here, I think my discipline of design really needs to have some mechanisms for sketching through all the options that machine learning systems might deliver, both good and bad. And we're really trying to teach designers how to work with these. And then third, I think we need to advance design education to make designers more prepared for a data-driven future. I think um, there aren't a lot of design curricula that are doing this, and we need to expand to include understanding basic skills for working with people and machine learning. So I'm gonna stop there and I'll take some questions. Thank you. Well, this is, uh, as, I, as I was seeing this, I was thinking like, man, this would have been great for you know, during the summer for me. I was, I was thinking about that. I thought I was going to talk to him. But the, but the thing is, is that, you know, how do you square the fact that most of the time, and I mean, I, I, I would assume most of the time what's happening is, is that you, there's some underlying functionality like, oh, we, you know, we have some knowledge of Q-shot learning, so now we can, uh, you know, we can, we can do this task with these images, and um, we, we designed this interface now, okay, designer, make people trust it, and improve the user experience, right? How do you, how do you square, like, the, you know, where this type of activity should take place, which is really before any of those decisions are right. getting made. Well, first of all, we would hope to advocate to have designers working along with the team the whole time. Um, but second of all, I think we can also um, make designers better understand how the technology works, how we look at failure cases, and so on and so forth. So number one, bring, bring design to the table early. But number two, you know, deliver the best designers to work with this, these kinds of systems. Yeah. I'm really glad you brought up the second point in the last slide, which is about the errors. Um, when you're trying to prototype something for a system, ML system that doesn't exist, you have to be really imaginative about the error cases. But the errors that ML systems come up with are completely like something that you don't think about. And I almost feel like you have to have some sort of decisions on the type of algorithm that you're going to use in order to imagine these errors because these errors are, depend on the algorithm. Some algorithms come up with certain types of errors and some algorithms yeah. don't. So um, is that, should you be thinking What do you think? I think that's a great that? comment and suggestion. And um, you know, I think some of the fledgling work in design patterns here can be useful if we can at least, so, you know, designers will approach a problem by trying to bucket and categorize. So I think even giving them some simple patterns of failure to start and bucket, to bucket and categorize might be a good first step. I'm thinking about this a lot because we're struggling to figure out how to teach students how to do this. Thanks, thank you for your comment. Yeah. I'm wondering what you're doing from an education perspective with your designers to kind of demystify ML systems. You know, we've been doing stuff in the 
in our lab to just kind of get basic terminology, understand the difference between different ML approaches. Is that a good thing that they get their hands really dirty with the engineering, or is that a bad thing? Is it? John and Jan just uh, taught a course called uh, Design and AI, right? Designing AI products and services. So I've been following along silently, but she can tell you um, they, they teach students about some of the basics of technology and then let them play with the technology as a design medium. And yes, I think the question is how much can we afford to cram in and what's even relevant to cram in because you know in another couple of years the whole landscape could change. Uh, fascinating presentation. I was curious to hear your thoughts on when as, as designers, what role do we have to play when our stakeholders uh, have faith on their own expertise and thereby, regardless of whatever we do, the end product is like, I don't know, like at that point, given sort of like using machine learning to design, I was curious to hear about like what what would be a more pragmatic, because I've, I've hit the same ceiling where like cybersecurity experts when dealing with AI systems like, no, like that's not what we do here. And then that's the end of the session. Well, um, one of the main actions of design is often reframing or pivoting. So we could take that belief that you're an expert and you don't want to use this technology, and we could study your um, workflow and your context, and then maybe we could pivot around a design solution that brings the technology to you in a way that's not um, invasive or stigmatizing or demeaning. So I think you know that's kind of what the discipline of design has been doing for a long time. Not with them now, but with other kinds of technology. I know these chairs rise and ask you a comments. There was this uh, blog post or, or, or a panel not so long ago, John Maeda, basically said, eh, the site is not that important, <laughs> and, or something of that sort. And I wanted to, and that is a prelude to you, know, I, you're preaching to the choir. I think that the site has something important to say about uh, machine learning. But do we see the same? hunger for knowledge from the you know, point of view, like, you know what, we need to know more about design. Let's teach our engineers more about design, the same way we want to teach it for designers more about engineers. And how to, how to cross that bridge? Yeah, we were talking about this last night at this alumni event I was at. There, there's a lot of excitement about design thinking, but it's almost like a, a buzzword. We don't really understand that core idea of um, what it means to really do design. And so I, I think, I hope, and you know what, what my career has been about is bringing that evidence directly to computer scientists and engineers by collaborating with them. So you know, I hope it's done in a respectful and purposeful way, but I do think it's important.